Good morning and welcome to Trinity. My name is Kyle and whether you're worshiping with us in person or online, I want to thank you for taking part of your weekend to spend a little time with us. You can let us know you're here today by either filling out the flap on your bulletin and dropping it in the offering basket when it goes by later in the service, or by filling out the online connect card at trinityruston.org hub. If this is your first time visiting Trinity, we especially want to thank you for being here. So before you leave this morning, stop by the information table to get a free gift. You can find everything you need to know about what's happening around here by visiting the Trinity Hub at trinityruston.org. But right now, I'd like to take just a few minutes to share a few of the great things coming up soon at Trinity. This week at Vacation Bible School, our kids are exploring the Jerusalem Marketplace, where they're learning important truths about Jesus and what he did for each and every one of us. We want to invite you to join us this Wednesday evening at 5.30 for dinner, worship, and fellowship as we share all that we've done and learned at VBS this year. The deadline to join us in the Holy Land this fall is June 21st. This trip will take you through some of the most important places in biblical history like Jericho, the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee, and of course, Jerusalem. Being able to see and experience the places where some of your favorite Bible stories happened will make your faith more personal and deepen your understanding of the people and places we read about in Scripture. Visit the Trinity website to find all the details about this life-changing trip and to reserve your spot with us today. Thanks again for joining us this morning. We know that God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel his love in a new and fresh way. Remember to stay connected with us throughout the week on Facebook, Instagram, and at our website, trinityruston.org. I'd also like to encourage you to invite someone new to come to church with you. Your invitation just might be the spark that makes a lasting impact on somebody's life. So have a great week, and when you come back, bring a friend. Good morning. I have one more announcement that wants to get added to the list. If you've ever wanted to sing in the chancel choir, but you were afraid of Wednesday night rehearsals, boy, do I have a deal for you. During the summer, the choir rehearses only on Sunday morning. So if you wanted to be a part of the choir, I mean, look at them. They're so friendly. And, and if you've ever wanted to be a part of the choir, just be in the choir room at 8.30 on Sunday mornings. That's when the anthem is rehearsed. And, and you can join and try it out and, and, and see how you do in the chancel choir. Let us pray. On Pentecost Day long ago, your great spirit came upon the saints in Jerusalem. May your spirit come upon us, this community of faith, this day. We welcome the flame and light of your spirit here in this place. Renew us with an energized faith and affirm us as your people here to worship and to celebrate with strength and courage and hope in Christ. Amen. For the hymn of praise, the affirmation of faith, and the glory of Patre, would you stand?
Let me invite you to remain standing and join with us as we begin to prepare our hearts for Holy Communion by praying together the prayer of confession listed in your worship folder as well as on the screen. Creating God, in love you moved over the waters of chaos and separated sea from dry land, and yet we cling tightly to rigid boundaries of our own making. You claim us in the waters of baptism and declare us dead to sin and alive in Christ. But too often we deny that call, conforming ourselves to the whims of culture. At Pentecost, you released your wild and transforming spirit to flow through church and world. But we want to tame that wildness channeling your spirit through banks of ordered safety. Transform us, we pray. Soften the unyielding edges of our hearts. Loosen our grip on the way it's always been and prepare us for the joy of the way it still can be. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Please be seated. This time, let me invite you to take a moment and offer your silent prayers of confession unto God. Jesus Christ is our ark. His power is unequaled. His grace is unrestrained. His strength is steadfast. And his embrace is sufficient to carry all that we are and hope to be. Friends, believe the good news in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now may we go to God together in prayer. Almighty God, we are thankful for your forgiveness. We are thankful for your grace. Lord, the ways that we fail you as individuals, as people groups, and as a church are ever before us. Lord, we have no defense. We have no hope outside of Christ. So we fall again upon his mercy. We look again to the cross, to the empty tomb, and to the cleansing power and presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives. We do pray in these moments for transformation. We pray to walk away from this time together different, more like your son, more and more holy, closer to you. Lord, may we also go into the world transformed to transform it as well. May we be doorways through which your spirit flows into the hearts and the lives of those in our families, our neighborhoods, our community, and beyond. Lord, may we truly be salt and light and may we be a shining example of your grace in this dark and difficult world. Lord God, we do ask, as we always do, for healing. We ask for grace. We ask for guidance. We ask for comfort. We ask for an awareness of your presence for those we love. And Lord, we come together as always, finding our words falling short, struggling to say the right things. So we join together, knowing that we can pray with confidence as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As the ushers come forward, we prepare to continue our worship through our giving as we do so. I'd like to remind you there are various ways that you can give. You can leave your gifts in the offering plate. You can also give digitally via the Trinity Hub or text to give. May we pray. Almighty God, your rule and your reign are unquestioned and unchallenged. All that we see, all that we know are yours. So we return just a portion of that back to you today with grateful hearts. We ask your blessing to be upon what is given and upon those that give. For the sake of your kingdom, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Please be seated. Our lesson this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church at Rome, Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Hear these words. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. It is that very same Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Innovations come slowly to the church. It was nearly a thousand years of Christian worship before an innovative piece of technology known as a church organ entered churches. One of the oldest organs and one of the organs we have the the longest history of in English is the organ that was installed in Winchester Cathedral about a thousand AD. The organ had 400 pipes. It took two men to play the organ, and the organ bellows were inflated by 70 men blowing simultaneously into the bellows. When the organ was played, it could be heard all throughout the town and the valley. And I guarantee you, somebody walked out of church on Sunday morning saying, that organ was too loud this morning. One of the ancient technologies that entered the church were found up in the pitch of the roof, the very highest point. There were little secretive trap doors up there. And on Pentecost Sunday, at the appointed time, the servants were sent to shinny up the roof. And when the priest gave the nod, little trap doors were open. And the servants turned doves loose in the church. And the doves flew down in among the people. And the choir boys started singing whoosh, 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 and banging on drums. And the priest would finish this this Holy Spirit moment by again signaling to the Holy Spirit holes. That's what they were called. And bushels upon bushels of rose petals were released and would float down. And in very tangible, very human ways, these, this Holy Spirit holds the innovation into the cathedrals, allowed people to experience again the power, the presence, the majesty, and the wonder of Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost. The coming of the Holy Spirit on the church, the day we celebrate as the birthday of the church where those frightened, defeated apostles were turned into the bold witnesses for Jesus Christ. Pentecost, the service where the Holy Spirit fell and people heard them speaking all in their same languages. Holy Spirit came and fell. And the disciples were so enthusiastic. They were so filled with joy. They were so filled with life that the critics said, oh, you're drunk. And the first point of Simon Peter's Pentecost sermon was, we're not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. What would happen if the Holy Spirit fell into our lives and God accused us in our church services of being drunk? 
of being excited, of being thrilled. As I thought about the, the holes in the cathedrals, I wondered if you and I have Holy Spirit holes in our lives, if we have places where God can speak to us. We have places where God in that still small voice nudges us and encourages us and calls us into deeper levels of discipleship, calls us to follow him more closely, calls us to be bold witnesses for Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit became the power that transformed the ragtag group of Jesus followers into the bold apostles of the first century church. And they didn't get everything right. When you read the book of Acts, you sort of read the starts and the stops that the early church had, but they had the spirit that continued to encourage them, that continued to call them, that continued to woo them to do that which God wanted to do, to do those things that would transform and change the world. They became what is known as learning communities, people who boldly figure it out while they're doing it. Jesus promised the Spirit. In the 14th chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. The Greek word advocate there is paraclete, and that becomes John's image for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete, the one called alongside to help. The King James translates it as comforter, and the word comforter comes from the, the Latin word to be brave, to be brave together is what comforter literally in its ancient form means. And that it's what being comforted is. Somebody brave come alongside you and walk you through a darkness. Anyway, Jesus promised this other advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it, is it, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because, listen to this, he abides with you and he will be in you. Holy Spirit is that part of the Trinity that resides in us. Is that part of the Trinity that prays for us and with us when we don't know how to pray? It is that part of the Trinity that convicts us and convicts, convinces us of sin and causes us to enter into a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. It is the comforter, the one who calls us to be brave. It is also the advocate, the one who stands beside us and advocates on our behalf. And then John continues in the 16th chapter. Jesus said, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me where are you going. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to be with the Father and you will see me no longer, and about judgment because the ruler of the world has been condemned. In writing inspired again by the Holy Spirit, John shifts the meaning of the word advocate at this point. It's the same Greek word paraclete, but it's now the picture of a Roman judge. It is the judge sitting at the bar. In Roman courts, courts were held between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. 
so that the witnesses could testify in the court and then get back to work. Can you imagine today the courthouse at 5 a.m. to 7 a.m.? The Holy Spirit is pictured as a judge, not to condemn, but a judge that encourages us encourages us almost every Thursday afternoon or Thursday yeah it's Thursday afternoon of my life I'm in Tommy Rogers drug court and I'm part of the drug court staff and Judge Rogers has a procedure with the clients in drug court they come to the little podium and he asks them two questions. The first question he asks is, tell me something good that's happened to you. And they hem, and they haw, and they sort of shuffle back and forth on their feet. And he said, now I told you I was going to ask this question. You should be prepared. Tell me something good that has happened to you. And I've learned to sit there and pray, okay, God, I need to be able to answer that in case Judge Rogers looks over here at the jury box and asks us to say something good. What good has happened in my life since last I was here? And it's allowed the Holy Spirit to start working in my life and explain and show me the good things going on, the blessings people have had, the answers to prayer that people are knowing, the, the overcoming that some people are doing. And even in my own life, the overcoming I'm doing and the answers to prayer. And, and it's just a, a Holy Spirit. You didn't know you have a Holy Spirit moment in a courtroom, did you? Yes, you can. There it is. But it's the second question that he asks. That Thursday just struck me so pointedly. He will say at the end of their conversation and his conversation with them, is there anything we can do for you? And they sort of treat it as a throwaway question. No, I'm, I'm fine. Or maybe one or two of them ask for very small things like to, to take a trip that has to be court approved. Is there anything we can do for you? And I thought, there's, there are lawyers, there are counselors, there's clergy, church staff are there. There are all sorts of resources that could come to bear on helping these people continue the journey they are making toward wholeness, toward conquering their addiction. Is there anything we can do for you? You and I, as those who have received the Holy Spirit, are in fact standing before the bar and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are asking us, is there anything we can do for you? Is there anything the Spirit of God can do for you to encourage you into your journey of faith? Is there anything the Spirit of God can do in helping you forgive yourself for failures you may have experienced, to help you experience the unconditional love and grace of God in Jesus Christ? Is there anything that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit can do as you walk this journey of faith? It's not a throwaway question. It's a question that comes to us from our Lord. It's a question he asked Bartimaeus so long ago when he met blind Bartimaeus on the road, and he said to Bartimaeus, what is it you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus said, I, wanted, I want to see again. What do you want God to do for you? What do you want God to do through you? Can you answer that question? What is it we can do for you?
So as you come to the holy table this morning, the table of our Lord, the, the table of holy communion, I want you to hear that question whispered in your ear. Is there anything we can do for you to encourage you in your Christian journey? Is there anything we can do for you to make your family stronger? Is there anything we can do for you to help you overcome that with which you struggle? It's Jesus asking you that question through the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus inviting you to this table where we're reminded of his sacrifice and his love. And we're reminded that just as the Holy Spirit has come as a paraclete, as the one called alongside to help, we walk each step of our journey with the help and the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me invite you to join with us in the liturgy that will prepare our hearts to receive communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. 
by your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. If you're helping us with communion this morning, would you come forward now? And as we're preparing to serve you, I remind you, as I always do, that this is the Lord's table, that you are all welcome and invited to receive the sacrament of communion. We serve communion by intention, by receiving a piece of the bread and dipping it in the chalice. We invite you to spend a moment at the altar praying if you'd like to do that after receiving communion. Also, we take a second communion offering on Sunday, on communion Sunday. That offering goes to CCA. And if you'd like to give to that, we invite you to do so uh, as you come down for communion. The ushers will assist you as you come after the choir has been served.
stand. And now may the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and abide with you always. Amen. Watching the live broadcast from Trinity United Methodist Church in Ruston, Louisiana. I'm Reverend Doug DeGraffin Reed, and I want to thank you for choosing to be a part of our worshiping community today. Our prayer is that God has used this time to speak specifically to you, wherever you are on your faith journey. 
At Trinity, our goal is to help you live into a deeper relationship with Jesus and reach wider in serving the world He loves. For more information about how you can live deeper and reach wider, visit us online at trinityruston.org and let us know how we can help you reach the next step of your walk with Christ. Thanks again for watching, and we look forward to seeing you soon.